Hello and welcome back to our Wednesday Bible study. I'm glad you joined me again. Uh, I know a lot of you have been very faithful in this study and I appreciate you uh, uh, staying with me and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Uh, this will be our last session of Knowing God, Seeing God with 2020 Vision. Um, we're going to take a little break for a few weeks, uh, just like we normally would. You know, normally on Wednesday nights, we take a break in the summer and come back when school starts. And so right now, that's our plan, is to take a break for now and then come back when school starts. Uh, not exactly sure what study we'll do uh, in August, but we will come back with something, or at least that's the plan right now. Um, hoping more and more people will be able to get out and come in person on Wednesday nights um, soon, but uh, we're going to still try and make provision for those of you who can't. And, um, and provide something online, whether that's just recording what we're doing here in person on Wednesday nights or actually uh, just a pre-recorded uh, study like I'm doing right now. Uh, but either way, we'll start something back here in a few weeks. And thanks again for joining me for this study. Um, again, I, I, I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have. Uh, I find that my heart is, is drawn to love God more and, and want to worship Him more, the better I know who He really is, as He showed Himself to us in Scripture. And so doing this study, knowing God, seeing God with 2020 vision, I've, um, I've just really uh, felt my, my uh, worship life and, and devotional life improved, and I, and I hope yours has as well. Uh, what I want to do today in our last uh, session of this is something a little bit different. Each week we've looked at uh, different characteristics of God, uh, but here's what I want to do today is not actually look at a characteristic of God, but teach you how to continue to do this on your own. Uh, to teach you how to, uh, on a daily basis, get into God's Word and, and really know Him better. And I know a lot of you watching this, you, you know pretty well how to do that. Some of you might be better at that than me, but I thought it'd be a good way to end, to say, okay, here are some practical ways to make sure we're really reading God's Word and seeing God clearly uh, so we can know Him personally and love Him, live for Him, and lead others to Him. And so I want to begin um, our time today by reading Matthew chapter 4. Uh, a lot of you know this is where... Uh, Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And listen to what it says, uh, the first four verses. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let me read that last verse again to you. Jesus said, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You and I, our spiritual life, um, our spiritual growth is dependent on us hearing what God is saying and what God has said in the past. And so it's essential, just as Jesus says here. He says, listen, um, you know, uh, we cannot live on bread alone. We can't live on just the things of this world. We need something spiritual. We need God, and we need God speaking to us through His Word. Um, and so I'm not saying that if you're not reading God's Word daily that you're not saved or something like that. We know that being saved is a supernatural um, gift uh, by grace through faith, trusting in Jesus Christ. But what I am saying is if we're going to grow spiritually, and we're going to become deeper and know God better and all those things, we must be in God's Word. And I don't think that's a surprise to most of you watching this. And so what I want to do is, is just kind of go through. These are some things we've covered before in life groups and even in some of our worship services. Uh, but I hope you've, you'll grab a pen or pencil, some paper, and write these down. You may have heard them before, but I find it's good. Every time I, re I review these for myself, um, I find them helpful. So um, grab something to write with. If you need to pause this video, man, that, that's a, uh, one of the benefits of doing this the way we are. You can just pause me right now. You can grab something to write with and then restart the video. But let me give you um, three questions to ask as you study God's Word. I, I find these very helpful, and I hope you will too. The first question is this. As you read God's Word, is ask, what does it say? We need to be asking ourselves, what does God's Word say? What is it <clears throat> saying? And, and so to, to understand what it's saying, we need to do some practical things. First of all, to understand what God's Word is saying, we've got to read it, right? We've got to be in God's Word, and our goal should really be in God's Word daily. And I know many of you probably are, but let me encourage you again uh, to make it a priority to be in God's Word. 
Uh, you may want to do what I'm doing this year, and I, I'm reading through the whole Bible in a year, uh, but you may just want to take a book of the Bible and just read very slowly through it. Um, uh, but w whatever you do, I want to encourage you to be in God's Word. And I do think it's good um, most of the time that we are reading through books of the Bible. So not necessarily that you've got to read through the whole Bible like I'm doing right now, but when you read Scripture, say read through the book of Philippians, a chapter a day, or read through the book of Matthew, a chapter a day until you get through it. I don't think it's healthy in the long run if we just have a steady diet of jumping all over the Bible. And so let me encourage you to read God's Word daily and to read it, um, uh, you know, a book at a time or maybe even read through the Bible. So when we're trying to understand what God has said in His Word, we've got to read it, and I hope we're doing it daily, and, and we've also got to read God's Word slowly. So read God's Word daily as we're asking what it says, and then read God's Word slowly. You know, if we're not careful, we can, we can read quickly and we can miss a lot of stuff, and we can misunderstand stuff. And I've been guilty of that, and sometimes you're just reading real quickly and, and you miss something. I, <clears throat> I've got a story I've, you may have heard me tell it before, but uh, years ago, I think I was in college, and one of my good friends named Cody, we were picking up a friend at a hospital um, they were serving it. They were working at the hospital. They weren't as a, there as a patient. And um, it was after hours. It was kind of late at night, and we were there to pick them up. And uh, I, I, we must have misunderstood where they said to go, and a lot of the hospital was kind of locked down, and there weren't a lot of people around. And so we found a door that was unlocked, and we went in this door, and we started going down the hallway. And um, this person that we were looking for had been serving as a volunteer on a suicide helpline, a hotline. And so... Um, we're walking down the hall. We're trying to figure out where to go. We don't see anybody. And we see this sign, and my friend Cody says, oh, look, that sign says personal, that, and it points this way. Our friend's helping out with suicide prevention. What could be more personal than that? Let's go this way. And, and me, being foolish, I just follow right along with him. We walk, and we follow these signs. We see personal to the right and personal to the left. And we go down these long hallways. Finally, we get to these doors that are locked, and they won't open. And we realize we've, we've got to turn around. And then I finally look at the sign that he's been saying says personal. And you know what it said? I bet some of you could guess. It didn't say personal. It said personnel. <laughs> the whole time we were walking toward a personnel office, we, we had no idea where we were going. But you see what happens when we sometimes read things too quickly. We, we can misunderstand. Um, I've done that. You've done that. So as we read God's Word, we need to make sure we're reading it daily. Make sure that we're reading it slowly. And thirdly... Let me encourage you to read God's Word prayerfully. Um, I try to never read God's Word in my devotion, in my quiet time, until I've stopped and prayed and asked God to speak to me. And the reason I do that is because I want to be careful to not read the Bible just like some textbook or some history book or some rule book. I want to read it as the living Word that it is. And I need the Holy Spirit to interpret it to me, to, to speak um, to me using scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. It's so important as we seek to understand God and understand His Word that we have the help of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a believer and you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But stop and pray and ask the Holy Spirit would you speak to me through Scripture? Would you help me understand it? Don't just throw open the Bible and start reading real fast and trying to figure it, out, figure it out on your own, but ask God to help you. Ask His Spirit to help you. So as we seek to understand God and understand His Word, we're going to ask three questions. And so far we've just been on the first question, and that is, what does it say? To know what the Word says, we've got to read it daily, read it slowly, and read it prayerfully. Now, the second question we're going to ask is this, what does it mean? So what does it say, and then what does it mean? And what I mean by that is what did it mean in its original context, so its original audience? And so let me give you some things that will help you understand its original meaning. First of all, read God's Word in context. Okay, and that's why I was encouraging you earlier to make sure you're reading a book at a time and not just jumping all around. Um, it, it's so dangerous to just read a little scripture here and a little scripture there uh, because we can misinterpret it. So we got to read God's Word in context. I mean, just think about this. If you say, give her a hand, 
Think about the different things that can mean if you don't have context. You see, if you say give her a hand at a concert, it means an applause, right? If you say give her a hand on a hike or on a ledge, it could literally mean giving someone um, your hand. Or you could say uh, give her a hand, it could mean just helping someone at work. So it could mean clapping, it can mean assisting someone, it can mean literally giving them your hand to, to pull them up. So when you hear a phrase like, give her a hand, you gotta know the context. Same thing's true in scripture. We gotta understand the context of the verses we're reading. Um, <clears throat> and so as we think about context, let me mention a couple of different kinds of context to consider. First of all, we gotta think about the literary context. Okay, what I mean by that is, is we need to read the verses that are before and after it. Right? That's the kind of common sense. That's so that we really understand um, what was originally meant. Read the verses before and after it. Read the verse in light of the big picture. Where does it fit in the overall story of the Bible? Where does it fit in the overall story of the book that it's in? Uh, what's going on? Who's it talking to? Um, who's the one saying it? What are the circumstances around it? So the literary context, read the verses before and after it, read it in light of the big picture, and then recognize what genre it is. You know, uh, in the Bible we have history, we have prophecy, we have poetry, we have letters, um, we have an Old Testament, we have a New Testament, and so um, we need to recognize the genre. So all of those fit under understanding the literary context. And then we also want to understand the cultural context. Um, for example, think about the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. He tells women that they must have their heads covered in church. Now, why don't we still practice that? Well, it's because in that time, in that city of Corinth, um, for women to have their heads uncovered, it was a cultural thing. If women had their heads uncovered, it was a sign of rebellion, and it was often a sign that you were a prostitute. So when the Apostle Paul is telling them to have their heads covered, it's a very practical instruction for a very specific time in history in a very specific city saying, hey, don't, don't act rebellious and certainly don't act like a prostitute. So it wasn't so much an issue of no one ever wearing head, cover head coverings ever. It was more an understanding of, it was an issue of women not acting rebellious or acting like prostitutes. But we gotta know the cultural context uh, to understand that. So we gotta ask the question, what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible mean? As we think about what the Bible means, we, we got to understand its context, literary context, cultural context, and then also historical context. It helps us um, if we know what was going on in the world when we're reading something. So it's helpful to understand um, when you're reading um, in the Old Testament, uh, if, to understand what different nations were doing and, and to understand when Israel was conquered by Babylon or by Assyria and, and how the people were carried off. And understanding that when you're reading books that were written during that time adds so much more meaning to what's really going on and what's really being said. I remember back when I was in college, we took a, at Oklahoma Baptist University, we took a class called Western Civ, Western Civilization. And it was really neat because what they did is you had two professors. You had a history professor and a literature professor, and they took turns teaching. And so you were led to read works of literature, um, and at the same time, you had the history professor uh, telling you what was going on in the world when that was written. So you might read something that was written in the Middle Ages, and the, professor, the literature professor is going to explain the literary work to you, but then the history professor is going to tell you what was going on in the world, and it added so much more depth and meaning to what we were reading. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here is understanding what was going on in the world. Um, just thinking about Lamentations. If you go and read Lamentations and Awaken, it's kind of sound depressing <laughs> and you wonder what, what's going on? What was wrong with these people that they were so depressed? But when you understand it was such a difficult time of exile, yet a time that still held on to God's promises, uh, it, it opens up so much more of the meaning of the book and what God is saying there. So um, understand the context, the literary context, the cultural context, the historical context. I'll tell you, if you don't have one, a chronological Bible will really help you to do this. Also, just a good study Bible or a life application Bible. Uh, those are great, great tools that will help you understand these things. Uh, continuing to think about what does it mean, a couple other tools. We've talked about being reading it in context. Also, you want to read God's Word in multiple translations when you're really trying to understand it. So, uh, say you use the New Living Translation a lot, you may want to also look at the Christian Standard Bible or the New King James Version. 
Um, the ESV, there are a lot of great translations and sometimes it just helps us better understand what's being said if we read it in more than one translation. And let me just say all the modern translations we have are very accurate. You don't have to fret or worry about that. Uh, but just compare them because they'll kind of give you some additional insight if you look at more than one translation. And then also as you're thinking about what does it, what does it mean, um, you want to compare scripture with scripture. You know, often when you're reading your Bible uh, next to the verse, you'll see another tiny little verse reference next to that, and, and that's a cross-reference. And if you look that up, um, you'll see verses that relate to the verse that you just read. And that's a great way to have a better understanding of Scripture. And so uh, using cross-references, a concordance, a, a word study. Um, also, as we compare Scripture with Scripture, we always, and this is really important, I don't want to skim over this too quickly, it's always important that we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. The New Testament is the ultimate fulfillment of God's Word, and it sheds light on the Old Testament. And if we're not careful, it's easy to misunderstand the Old Testament if you don't read it in light of the New Testament. Uh, just think about reading through the book of Leviticus, and you have all these Levitical laws. Have you ever thought to yourself, why don't we still practice these? There's all these rules about sacrificing animals and when to do it and how to do it. Why don't we do those things anymore? Well, it's because we interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament. And when we do that, we know Jesus came as the one perfect sacrifice once and for all. So we no longer have to offer sacrifices. So when we read the Levitical laws, we no longer read those and say, okay, here's how I need to sacrifice an animal. Now we read those and try to grasp the understanding of how important it was that blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins and how Jesus shed his blood for us and then worship Jesus because he paid that price because he became the Lamb of God for us. So to really understand Scripture, we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture, especially interpreting the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. And so we've asked these questions so far. What does it say? And to know what it says, we read the word daily, slowly, and prayerfully. Then we ask, what does it mean? To, to understand that, we read it in context, literary context, context, cultural context, and historical context. We read God's word in multiple translations, and we compare scripture with scripture. And then finally, what does it mean for my life? So we, don't know, we want to know what does it say, and then specifically, what did it mean to the people it was originally written to? And now we're prepared to ask the question, now, what does it mean for me? Um, and, and this is not a time we get to just twist it and make it mean whatever we want it to mean. Um, we want to be careful to say, okay, if it meant this in its original context with its original audience, it, it's going to mean something similar to me, although there might be some modern practical applications in my life. So when reflecting on how to apply God's Word to your life, let me give you some questions to ask. Um, if you're taking notes, you're going to have to write kind of quickly. Um, we've mentioned these before in church. I think it's been a while, um, but this, there's an acronym to help you remember this. It's kind of a funny one, but it's, it's space pets, okay? S space pets, and each of those letters will stand for something I'm about to mention, a question we should ask as we try to apply God's Word. Okay, so the letter S in space pets is sin. Is there a sin to confess? So as we're seeking to apply God's Word, um, we want to ask ourselves, is there a sin that's mentioned here that I need to admit to God? Uh, maybe you're reading through Exodus 20 and it's the Ten Commandments and you see there that we should not lie. And God convicts you that you've lied in some way. It's time to confess that, a sin to confess and ask for forgiveness. The P is, is there a promise to claim? Uh, you may read through like Philippians 4.19 where it says, My God will meet all your needs um, according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And you need to hold on to that promise and know that maybe even though you're facing difficult circumstances, God will meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus. So is there a sin to confess, a promise to claim? The A is, is there an attitude to change? Uh, some of you are watching this with your spouse, and right now you're going to nudge your spouse and say, you need an attitude adjustment, right? And, no, I'm just not, probably not a good move for your marriage. But, but seriously, you, know, you maybe read a verse like Philippians 2.5 that says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And so you feel this conviction that I've not had a good attitude. I've not been humble like Jesus. I've not been a servant. I've not been loving. I've not been forgiving. So is there an attitude to change? The C, is there a command to obey? Uh, Ephesians 4.13 says to, to forgive 
one another just as God through Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So maybe in your quiet time you're reading through Ephesians, you get to Ephesians 4.32 and you see this command that says to forgive others. And God convicts you that there's, there's someone you're not forgiving. And so you need to, at that moment, ask Him to help you forgive. At the E is, is there an example to follow? Maybe it's a positive example to follow. Maybe it's a negative example to avoid. Maybe the, uh, you're reading through Genesis and you come to Joseph and you see this example, this good example of someone trusting God even in difficult circumstances, even when he can't understand why all these bad things are happening. So you want to follow that example. Or maybe you're reading later in Scripture and you come across Saul, King Saul, and you see him acting prideful and, and going against God and you, and you see a negative example to avoid. So... Uh, is there an example to follow? The P is, is there a prayer to pray? Something like Psalm one ni- um, yeah, 119.37 that says, Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Often I'll see a prayer that a psalmist prayed or a prayer that Paul prayed, uh, and, and I will be led to, to pray that prayer also. And so that's a great way to apply Scripture. The E is, is there an error to avoid? Um, is there a problem that you should be aware of? Like maybe say you're reading through Proverbs, you get to 16, 18, where it says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, the T, is there a truth to believe? Um, maybe what new things um, have you learned about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the church? Uh, maybe you're reading through Ephesians and you come to chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So we come to this incredible truth in Scripture, and we're, and we're reminded in our quiet time that we are saved by grace through faith. And it's nothing we've done. It's a gift. And so we just stop and we, we hold on to that truth and we meditate on it and we can praise God for it. So is there a truth to believe? And then finally, <clears throat> the last letter of Space Pets is S. Is there something to praise God for? And obviously there's overlap. We just, you know, that truth I just mentioned is something we should praise God for. Um, is there something to praise God for? Something I should be thankful for? Uh, like 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So Space Pets helps us apply Scripture to our lives. Sin to confess, promise to claim, attitude to change, command to obey, example to follow, prayer to pray, error to avoid, truth to believe, or something to praise God for. Now as we wrap up this session and we wrap up this study on knowing God, uh, the final word here is to really know God. We've got to be in His Word regularly. We've got to seek to understand it accurately and to apply it appropriately. Um, and let me kind of begin to end by saying this. One of the, the great joys I found of being in God's Word, and especially this has been true in my life the last few years, is the more I read God's Word, the more I see who God really is, and the more I'm amazed by His redemptive plan and how He's worked it out through history and how He's been so faithful. Um, earlier in my Christian life, I think sometimes all I did was read the Bible to learn how to live. I wanted to obey, and that's good, and I knew God had saved me by grace, but I didn't think much about that. I just focused on, God, give me some wisdom. Show me how to live. And, and, and those are important parts of Christianity. But the last few years, as I began to read God's Word more to just reflect on who God is and how amazing He is, and how amazing His grace is and His redemptive plan and again His faithfulness and His providence and all these things, it's just led me to have a heart to worship Him. It's led me to know Him better, to love Him more, and then to want to live for Him for the right reasons and to to want to lead other people to Him because I want them to know this amazing God that I know. So I guess what I'm kind of saying is I've just given you all these practical questions to ask, but let's be careful as we apply God's Word that, that we don't just make it all about doing the right thing and living the right kind of life. That's important. Please don't misunderstand. But let's not read God's Word only to know how to live. But let's read God's Word to know God better. When we do, 
we'll love him with all our hearts. We'll have a heart to worship him. We'll want to seek first his kingdom and we'll do it joyfully in all circumstances because we're amazed by God himself and by his grace and his mercy and how he has acted so faithfully throughout history, throughout scripture and in our own lives. So thank you so much for joining me for this study. Uh, I want to encourage you going forward, um, even though we won't be doing these videos for the next few weeks, um, this is not the end of knowing God. Uh, I hope and pray you're going to go much deeper than we've gone as you dig into God's Word um, that on a daily basis uh, in the ways we've just been talking about during this session. Uh, so thanks again for joining me. Uh, we'll uh, meet back together in a few weeks and begin another study, either myself or I, maybe even one of the other staff, but we'll try to provide something when school starts. Let me close this in prayer. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, the gift of revelation, Lord, of how you've revealed yourself to us, who you are and what you've done, Lord, how you love us, Lord, how you've saved us through Jesus. Father, I pray that we would never grow tired of digging into your word to know you better, uh, Lord, to rejoice in the good news of the gospel, how you've redeemed us and saved us, reconciled us to yourselves, Lord, given us eternal life, adopted us into your family. Father, may we daily be in your word and may we daily be transformed from being in your word as we're amazed by you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, thank you again and you have a blessed day.